Chapter 7. Now there were three of us sitting in the waiting room, waiting to hear how Dolly and Johnny were. Then the reporters and the police came. They asked too many questions too fast and got me mixed up. If you want to know the truth, I wasn't feeling real good in the first place. Kind of sick, really, and I'm scared of policemen anyway. The reporters fired one question right after another at me and got me so confused I didn't know what was coming off. Diary finally told them I wasn't in any shape to be yelled at so much, and they slowed down a little. Diary's kind of big. Soda Pop kept them in stitches. He grabbed one guy's press hat, that means laughing. He grabbed one guy's press hat and another's camera, walk around interviewing the nurses and mimicking two TV reporters. He tried to lift, meaning steal, a policeman's gun, and grinned so crazily when he was caught that the policeman had to grin too. Soda can make anyone grin. I managed to get hold of some hair grease and comb my hair back so that it looked a little better before they got any pictures. I'd die if I got my picture in the paper with my hair looking so lousy. Darry and Soda Pop were in their pictures too. Jerry Wood told me that if Soda Pop and Darry hadn't been so good, good looking, they wouldn't have taken so many. That was public appeal, he said. Soda was really getting a kick out of all this. I guess he would have enjoyed it more if it had not been so serious. But he couldn't resist anything that caused that much excitement. I swear sometimes he reminds me of a cult. A long-legged Palomino cult that has to get his nose into everything. The reporter stared at him admiringly. I told you, he looks like a movie star, and he kind of radiates. Finally, even Soda Pop got tired of the reporters. He gets bored with the same old thing after a time, and stretching out on a long bench, he put his head in Darry's lap and went to sleep. I guess both of them were tired. It was late at night, and I knew they hadn't had much sleep during the week. Even while I was answering questions, I remember that it had been only a few hours since I was sleeping off a smoke in a corner of the church. Already, it was an unreal dream, and yet, at the time, I couldn't have imagined any other world. Finally, the reporters started to leave along with the police. One of them turned and asked, What would you do right now if you could do anything you wanted? I looked at him tiredly. Take a bath. They thought that was pretty funny, but I meant it. I felt lousy. The hospital got real quiet after they left. The only noise was the nurse's soft footsteps and so does light breathing. Darry looked down at him and grinned half-heartedly. He didn't get much sleep this week, he said softly. He hardly slept at all. Hmm, said Soda drowsily. You didn't either. The nurses wouldn't tell us anything about Johnny and Dally, so Darry got hold of the doctor. The doctor told us that he would talk only to the family, but Darry finally got it through the guy's head that we were about as much family as Dally and Johnny had. Dally would be okay after two or three days in the hospital, he said. One arm was badly burned and would be scarred for the rest of his life, but he would have full use of it in a couple of weeks. Dally will be okay, I thought. Dallas is always okay. He could take anything. It was Johnny I was worried about. He was in critical condition. His back had been broken when that piece of timber fell on him. He was in severe shock and suffering from third-degree burns. They were doing everything they could to ease the pain, although since his back was broken, he couldn't even feel the burns below his waist. He kept calling for Dallas and Pony Boy. If he lived. If? Please no, I thought. Please not if. The blood was draining from my face and Darry put an arm across my shoulder and squeezed hard. Even if he lived, he'd be crippled for the rest of his life. You wanted it straight and you got it straight, said the doctor. Now go home and get some rest. I was trembling. A pain was growing in my throat and I wanted to cry, but creases don't cry in front of strangers. Some of us never cry at all, like Dally and Tubit and Tim Shepard. They forgot how at an early age. Johnny crippled for life? I'm dreaming, I thought in panic. I'm dreaming. I'll wake up at home or in the church and everything will be like it used to be. But I didn't believe myself. Even if Johnny did live, he'd be crippled and never play football or help us out in a rumble again. He'd have to stay in that house he hated where he wasn't wanted and things could never be like they used to be. I didn't trust myself to speak. If I said one word, the hard knot in my throat would swell and I'd be crying in spite of myself. I took a deep breath and kept my mouth shut. Soda was awake by then, and although he looked stony-faced as if he hadn't heard a word the doctor had said, his eyes were bleak and stunned. Serious reality has a hard time coming through the soda, but when it does, it hits him hard. He looked like I felt when I had seen that black-haired social line doubled up and still in the moonlight. Talking about Bob. Darry was rubbing the back of my head softly. We better go home. We can't do anything here. In our Ford, I was suddenly overcome by sleepiness. I leaned back and closed my eyes, and we were home before I knew it. Soda was shaking me gently. Hey, pony boy, wake up. You still got to get into the house. Hmm, I said sleepily, and lay down in the seat. I couldn't have gotten up to save my life. I could hear Soda and Darry, but it came but as if from a great distance. 
Oh, come on, pony boy, sort of pleaded, shaking me a little harder. We're sleepy, too. I guess Darry was tired of fooling around because he picked me up and carried me in. He's getting mighty big to be carried, so to said. I want to tell him to shut up and let, let me sleep, but I only yawned. You sure lost a lot of weight, Darry said. I thought, thought sleepily that I should at least pull off my shoes, but I didn't. I went to sleep the minute Darry tossed me on the bed. I'd forgotten how soft the bed really was. I was, up, I was the first one up the next morning. Soda must have pulled my shoes and shirt off for me. I was still wearing my jeans. He must have been too sleepy to undress himself, though. He lay stretched out beside me, fully clothed. I wheeled out from under his arm and pulled the blanket up over him, then went to take a shower. Asleep, he looked a lot younger than going on 17, but I had noticed that Johnny looked younger when he was asleep, too. So I figured everyone did. Maybe people are younger when they are asleep. After my shower, I put on some clean clothes and spent five minutes or so hunting for a hint of beard on my face and mourning over my hair. That bum haircut made my ears stick out. Darry was still asleep when I went into the kitchen to fix breakfast. The first one up has to fix breakfast and the other two do the dishes. That's the rule around our house. And usually it's Darry who fixes breakfast, breakfast rather, and me and Soda who are left with the dishes. I hunted through the ice box, that means refrigerator, and found some eggs. We, are, we all like our eggs done differently. I like them hard. Darry likes them in bacon and tomato sandwich. And Soda Pop eats his with grape jelly. Mm. All three of us like chocolate cake for breakfast. Mom had never allowed it with ham and eggs, but Darry let Soda and me talk him into it. We really didn't have to twist his arm. Darry loves chocolate cake as much as we do. Soda Pop always makes sure there's some in the icebox every night. If there isn't, he cooks up one up real quick. I like Darry's cakes better. Soda Pop always puts too much sugar in the icing. I don't see how he stands jelly and eggs and chocolate cake all at once. But he seems to like it. Darry drinks black coffee, and Soda Pop and I drink chocolate milk. We could have coffee if we wanted it, but we like chocolate milk. All three of us are crazy about chocolate stuff. Soda says if they ever make a chocolate cigarette, I'll have it made. Anybody home? A familiar voice called through the front screen, and 2-Bit and Steve came in. We always just stick our heads into each other's houses and holler, hey, and walk in. Our front door is always unlocked in case one of the boys is hacked off at his parents and needs a place to lay over and cool off. We never could tell who we find stretched out on the sofa in the morning. It was usually Steve, whose father told him about once a week to get out and never come back. Kind of bugs Steve, even if his old man does give him five or six bucks the next day to make up for it. Or it might be Dally, who lived anywhere he could. Once we even found Tim Shepard, leader of the Shepard gang, and far from his own turf, reading the morning paper in the armchair. He merely looked up and said, hi, and strolled out with staying for breakfast. Trubit's mother warned us about burglars, but Darry, flexing his muscles so that they bulged like oversized baseballs, Droll that he wasn't afraid of any burglars and that we didn't really have anything worth taking. He'd risk a robbery, he said, if it meant keeping one of the boys from blowing up and robbing a gas station or something. So the door was never locked. In here, I yelled, forgetting that Darry and Soda Pop were still asleep. Don't slam the door! <sighs> Sorry. They slammed the door, of course, and Tubit came running into the kitchen. He caught me by the upper arms and swung me around, ignoring the fact that I had two uncooked eggs in my hand. Hey, pony boy, he cried gleefully. Gleefully. Long time no see. You would have thought it had been five years instead of five days since I'd seen him last. But I didn't mind. I like old Two-Bit. He's a good buddy to have. He spun me into Steve, who gave me a playful slap on my bruised back and shoved me across the room. One of the eggs went flying. It landed on the clock, and I tightened my grip on the other one so that it crushed and ran all over my hand. Now look what you did, I griped. There went our breakfast. Can't you two wait till I set the eggs down before you go shove me all over the country? I really was a little mad because I had just realized how long it had been since I'd eaten anything. Last thing I'd eaten was a hot fudge sundae at the Dairy Queen in Windricksville. I was hungry. Tubit was walking in a slow circle around me and I sighed because I knew what was coming. Man, dig baldy here. He was staring at my head as he, as he circled me. I wouldn't have believed it. I thought all the wild Indians in Oklahoma had been tamed. What little squaws got that tough looking mop of yours, pony boy? Aw, oh, lay off, I said. I wasn't feeling too good in the first place, kind of like I was coming down with something. Tubit winked at Steve, and Steve said, why, he had to get a haircut to get his picture in the paper. They'd never believe a little greasy looking mug could be a hero. How do I like being a hero, big shot? How do I like what? Being a hero, you know. He shoved the morning paper at me impatiently, like a big shot even. I stared at the newspaper. On the front page of the second section was the headline, Juvenile Delinquents Turn Heroes. What I like is the turn bit, Two-Bit said, cleaning the egg up off the floor. 
Y'all were heroes from the beginning. It just didn't turn all of a sudden. I hardly heard him. I was reading the paper. That whole page was covered with stories about us. The fight, the murder, the church burning, the socialists being drunk. Everything. My picture was there with Darry and Soda Pop. The article told how Gianni and I had risked our lives saving those little kids, and there was a comment from one of the parents who said that they would all have burned to death if it hadn't been for us. It told the whole story of our fight with the socias, only they didn't say socias because most grown-ups don't know about the battles that go on between us. They had interviewed Cherry Valance, and she said Bob had been drunk and that the boys had been looking for a fight when they took her home. Bob had told her he'd fix us for picking up his girl. His buddy Randy Anderson who had helped jump us, also said it was their fault that we only fought back in self-defense. But they were charging Johnny with manslaughter. Then I discovered that I was supposed to appear at juvenile court for running away. And Johnny was too, if he recovered. Not if, I thought again. Why do they keep saying if? For once, there were any charges against Dally. And I knew he'd be mad because the paper made him out a hero for saving Johnny. And didn't say much about his police record, which he was kind of proud of. He'd kill those reporters if he got hold of them. There was another column about just Darry and Soda and me. How Darry worked on two jobs at once and made good at both of them, and about his outstanding record at school. I mentioned Soda Pop dropping out of school so we could stay together. And then I made the honor roll at school all the time and might be a future track star. Oh yeah, I forgot. I'm on the eighth A squad track team, the youngest one. I'm a good runner. That's like running varsity track as a freshman, which is really, really good. Then it said we shouldn't be separated after we had worked so hard to stay together. The meaning of that last line finally hit me. You mean, I swallowed hard, that they're thinking about putting me and Soda in a boys home or something? Like a foster home. Steve was carefully combing back his hair in complicated squirrels. Swirls. Something like that. I sat down in the daze. We couldn't get hold off now. Not after me and Darry had finally got through to each other. And now that the big rumble was coming up and we had settled this social creature thing once and for all. Not now, when Johnny needed us, and Dally was still in the hospital, and wouldn't be out for the rumble. No, I said out loud, and Tubit was scraping the egg off the clock, turned to stare at me. No what? No, they ain't going to put us in a boy's home. Don't worry about it, Steve said, cocksure that he and Soda Pop could handle anything that came up. They don't do things like that to heroes. We're Soda and Superman. That was as far as he got, because Darry, shaved and dressed, came in behind Steve and lifted him up off the floor, then dropped him. We all called Darry Superman or Muscles at one time or another. But one time Steve made a mistake of referring to him as all brawn and no brain, and Darry almost shattered Steve's jaw. Steve didn't call him that again, but Darry never forgave him. Darry has never really gotten over not going to college. That was the only time I'd ever seen Soda mad at Steve, although Soda attaches no importance to education. School bored him, no action. Soda came running in. Where's that blue shirt I washed yesterday? He took a swig of chocolate milk out of the container. Hate to tell you, buddy, Steve said, still flat on the floor, but you have to wear clothes to work. There's a law or something. Oh, yes, yeah, Soda said. Where are those wheat jeans, too? I iron. They're in the closet, Barry said. Hurry up. You're going to be late. Soda ran back, muttering, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying. Steve followed him, and in a second, there was the general racket of a pillow fight. I absentmindedly watched Darry as he searched the icebox for chocolate cake. Darry, I said suddenly, did you know about the juvenile court? Without turning to look at me, he said evenly, yeah, the cops told me last night. I knew then that he realized we might get separated. I didn't want to worry him anymore, but I said, I had one of those dreams last night, the one I can't ever remember. Darry spun around to face me, genuine fear on his face. What? I had a nightmare the night of mom and dad's funeral. I had nightmares and wild dreams every once in a while when I was little, but nothing like this one. I woke up screaming bloody murder. I never could remember what it was that had scared me. It scared Soda Pop and Darry almost as bad as it scared me. For night after night, for weeks on end, I would dream this dream and wake up in a cold sweater screaming. I never could remember exactly what happened in it. Soda began sleeping with me, and it stopped recurring so often, but it happened often enough for, that for Darry to take me to the doctor. The doctor said I had too much imagination. He had a simple cure, too. Study harder, read more, draw more, and play football more. After a hard game of football and four or five hours of reading, I was too exhausted mentally and physically to dream anything. But Darry never got over it, and every once in a while he would ask me if I ever dreamed anymore. Was it very bad, too, big question? He knew the whole story, and having never dreamed about anything but blondes, he was interested. No, I lied. I had awakened in a cold sweat and shivering, but Soda was dead to the world. I had just wiggled closer to him and stayed awake for a couple of hours, trembling under his arm. 
That dream always scared the heck out of me. Derek started to say something before he could begin. Soda Pop and Steve came in. You know what? Soda Pop said to no one in particular. When we stop those Soshis, good. Me and Stevie here are going to throw a big party and everybody can get stoned. Means drunk, okay? Not, not with the stone with the marijuana, okay? Then we'll go chase the socials clear to Mexico. Where are you going to get the dough, little man? Darry had found the cake and was handing out pieces. I'll think of something, Soda Pop assured him before bites. You going to take Sandy to the party? Sandy is Soda Pop's girlfriend. I asked just to be saying something. Instant silence. I looked around. What's the deal? Soda Pop was staring at his feet, but his ears were reddening. No. She went to live with her grandmother in Florida. How come? Look, Steve said, surprisingly angry. Does he have to draw you a picture? It was either that or get married, and her parents almost hit the roof at the idea of her marrying a 16-year-old kid. 17, Soda said softly. I'll be 17 in a couple of weeks. Oh, I said, embarrassed. Soda was no innocent. I had been in, on both sessions, and his bragging was as loud as anyone's. But never about Sandy. Not even after Sandy. Not ever, I'm sorry, not ever about Sandy. I remembered how her blue eyes had glowed when she looked at him, and I was sorry for her. There was a heavy silence, and Darry said, You better get on to work, Pepsi Cola. Darry really, rarely called Soda by Dad's pet nickname for him, but he did so then because he knew how miserable Soda Pop was about Sandy. I hate to leave you here by yourself, Pony Boy, Darry said slowly. Maybe you ought to take the day off. I've stayed by my lonesome before. You can't afford a day off. Yeah, but you just got back. I really ought to stay. I'll babysit him, Tubit said, ducking as I took a swing at him. I haven't gotten anything better to do. Why don't you get a job, Steve said. Ever consider working for a living? Work? Tubit was aghast. And ruin my rep? I wouldn't be babysitting a kid here if I knew of some good day nursery open on Saturdays. I pulled his chair over backward and jumped on him, but he had me down in a second. I was kind of short on wind. I forgot to cut out, cut out smoking or I won't, won't make track next year. Holler, uncle. Nope, I said struggling, but I didn't have my usual strength. Darry was pulling on his jacket. You two do up the dishes. You can go to the movies if you want to before you go see Dally and Johnny. He paused for a second, watching Tubit squash the heck out of me. Tubit lay off. He ain't looking so good. Pony boy, you take a couple of aspirins and go easy. You smoke more than a pack today, and I'll skin you. Understood? Yeah, I said, getting to my feet. You carry more than one bundle of roofing at a time today, and me and Soda will skin you. Understood? He grinned one of his rare grins. Yeah, see you all this afternoon. Bye, I said. I heard our Ford room and thought, so it is driving, and they left. Anyway, I was walking around downtown and started to take the shortcut through an alley. Tubit was telling me about one of his many exploits while we did the dishes. I mean, while I did the dishes. He was sitting on the cabinet, sharpening that black handle switchblade he was so proud of. And I ran to three guys. I says, howdy. And they just look at each other. Then one says, we would jump you, but since you're as slick as us, we figure you don't have nothing worth taking. I says, buddy, that's the truth and went right on. Moral, what's the safest thing to be when one is met by a gang of social outcasts in an alley? A judo expert, I suggested. No, another social outcast. Tubit yelped and nearly fell off the cabinet from laughing so hard. I had to grin too. He saw things straight and made them into something funny. We're gonna clean up this house, I said. Reporters or police or somebody might come by. Anyway, it's time for those guys from the state to come by and check up on us. This house ain't, ain't, this house ain't messy. You ought to see my house. I have. And if you had the sense of a billy goat, you'd try to help around your place instead of bumming around. Shoot, kid, if I ever did that, my mom would die of shock. I liked Tupit's mother. She had the same good humor and easygoing ways that he did. She wasn't lazy like him, but she just but she let him get away with murder. I don't know, though. It's just about impossible to get mad at him. When we had finished, I pulled on Dally's brown leather jacket. The back was burned black, and we started for 10th Street. I would drive us, Tupit said, as we walked up the street trying to thumb a ride. But the brakes are out of my car. Almost killed me and Kathy the other night. He flipped the collar of his black leather jacket up to serve as a windbreak while he lit a cigarette. You want to see Kathy's brother. Now there's a hood. He's so greasy he glides when he walks. He goes to the barber for an oil change, not a haircut. I would have laughed, but I had a terrific headache. We stopped at the Tasty Freeze to buy Cokes and rest up. And the blue Mustang that had been trailing us for eight blocks pulled in. Okay, blue Mustang, that means socials. I almost decided to run, and Tubit must have guessed this, for he shook his head ever so slightly and tossed me a cigarette. As I lit up, the socials who had jumped Johnny and me at the park hopped out of the Mustang. I recognized Randy Anderson, Marsha's boyfriend, and the tall guy that had almost drowned me. I hated them. It was their fault Bob was dead. Their fault Johnny was dying. 
Their fault Soda might get, might get put in a boys' home. I hated them as bitterly and as contemptuously as Dallas Winston hated. Tubin put an elbow on my shoulder and leaned against me, dragging on a cigarette. You know the rules. No jazz before the rumble, he said to the socias. We know, Randy said. He looked at me. Come here. I want to talk to you. I glanced at Tubit. He shrugged. I followed Randy over to his car out of earshot of the rest. We sat there in his car for a second, silent. Golly, that was the toughest car I've ever been in. I read about you in the paper, Randy said finally. How come? I don't know. Maybe I felt like playing hero. I wouldn't have. I would have let those kids burn to death. You might not have. You might have done the same thing. Randy pulled out a cigarette and pressed in the car lighter. I don't know. I don't know anything anymore. I would never have believed that Greaser could pull something like that. Greaser didn't have anything to do with it. My buddy over there wouldn't have done it. Maybe you wouldn't have done the same thing. Maybe a friend of yours wouldn't have. It's the individual. I'm not going to show at the Rumble tonight, Randy said slowly. I took a good look at him. He was 17 or so, but he was already old. Like Dallas was old. Cherry had said her friends were too cool to feel anything. And yet, the, she could remember watching sunsets. Randy was supposed to be too cool to feel anything, and yet, there was pain in his eyes. I'm sick of all this. Sick and tired. Bob was a good guy. He was the best buddy a guy ever had. I mean, he was a good fighter and tough and everything. But he was a real person, too. You dig? I nodded. He's dead. His mother has had a nervous breakdown. They spoiled him rotten. I mean, most parents would be proud of the kid, of a kid like that, good looking and smart and everything, but they gave in to him all the time. He kept trying to make someone say no, and they never did. They never did. That was what he wanted, for somebody to tell him no. To have somebody lay down the law, set the limits, give him something solid to stand on. That's what we all want, really. One time, Randy tried to grin. But I told him, he, but I could tell he was close to tears. One time he came home drunker than anything. He thought sure they were going to raise the roof, meaning the parents, his parents would be really angry. You know what they did? They thought it was something they'd done. They thought it was their fault that, that they'd failed him and driven to it or something. They took all the blame and didn't do anything to him. If his old man had just belted him just once, he might still be alive. I don't know why I'm telling you this. I couldn't tell anyone else. My friends, they think I was off my rocker or turning soft. Maybe I am. I just know that I'm sick of this whole mess. That kid, your buddy, the one that got burned, he might die. Yeah, I said, trying not to think about Johnny. And tonight, people get hurt in rumbles, maybe killed. I'm sick of it because it doesn't do any good. You can't win, and you know that, don't you? And when I remained silent, he went on. You can't win, even if you whip us. You'll still be where you were before, at the bottom. And we'll still be, still be the lucky ones with all the breaks. So it doesn't do any good. The fighting and the killing, it doesn't prove a thing. Well, forget it if you win or if you don't. Greasers will still be greasers and soldiers will still be socias. Sometimes I think it's the ones in the middle that are really the lucky stiffs. He took a deep breath. So I'd fight if I thought I'd do it do any good. I think I'm going to leave town. Take my little old Mustang and all the dough I can carry and get out. Running away won't help. Oh, hell, I know it, Randy half sobbed. But what can I do? I'll mark chicken if I punk out at the rumble. I hate myself if I didn't. I don't know what to do. I'll help you if I could, I said. I remembered Cherry's voice. Things are rough all over. I knew then what she meant. That both, yeah, the grease, pony boy just knows the greasers. Things are bad for the greasers. Okay? Cherry tells him, things are rough all over. That socials have problems too. Pony boy's starting to realize this now. He looked at me. No, you wouldn't. I'm a social. You get a little money and the whole world hates you. No, I said, you hate the whole world. He just looked at me. From the way he looked, he could have been 10 years older than he was. I got out of the car. You would have saved those kids if you had been there, I said. You'd have saved them the same as we did. Thanks, Grease, he said, trying to grin. Then he stopped. I didn't mean that. I mean, thanks, kid. My name's Pony Boy, I said. Nice talking to you, Randy. I walked over to Tubit, and Randy honked for his friends to come and get into the car. What do you want, Tubit asked. What Mr. Super Soch have to say? He ain't a Soch, I said. He's just a guy. He just wanted to talk. You want to see a movie, movie before we go see Johnny and Dallas? Nope, I said, lighting up another weed. I still had a headache, but I felt better. Socials were just guys after all. Things were rough all over, but it was better that way. That way you could tell the other guy was human too. Okay, that's the end of chapter 7. We'll talk about chapter 8, and we'll talk a little bit more chapter 7, but then we'll talk about chapter 8 uh, and what's coming up next.